Hello, and welcome to another edition of Sri's Sunday New York Times Read Along. We're back after a few weeks, and our guest is Dan Barry, longtime reporter and columnist for the New York Times. Our host is Sri Srinivasan, co founder of Digimentors. My name is Neil Parikh. I am the executive producer of Sri Sunday New York Times Read Along and occasional guest host when Sri is not available. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimentors website. Please like, please comment, please share, please let us know where you're watching from, and we'll put your comment on the screen. Before we dig in, I, we want to share a preview of today's show, and I do want to take a moment to let you know how thrilled I am personally to have Dan on today's show. He is just such a great storyteller, and I am thrilled, absolutely thrilled, that we'll be able to review a sample of his work with him. So without further ado, here's a little bit of what's to come. This week, our guest on Sri's Sunday New York Times read along is Dan Barry, longtime reporter and columnist for the New York Times. He is one of their best storytellers. We'll review a sample of his work and the print edition of the Sunday paper. Who doesn't like Entman's baked goods? Dan wrote about the role that Entman's played for his family growing up on Long Island. Dan's favorite is Raspberry Danish Twist. Mine, original recipe chocolate chip cookies. We'll also talk about a cautionary tale about a local school board vote in Croydon, New Hampshire. Local politics really does matter. The Case of Jane Doe Ponytail is another incredible piece. It was inspired by a headline that didn't do justice to a woman who died an anonymous death in Queens, New York. And what a headline on this piece. Ireland wanted to forget, but the dead don't always stay buried, about single mothers who were separated from their quote-unquote illegitimate spawn, and the heartbreaking tragedy of several deaths at a construction site in the Bronx, immigrant non-union workers toiling in an unsafe workplace. Dan Barry truly is a gifted writer. Sri Srinivasan is our host. I am the executive producer and occasional guest host, Neil Parekh. Paula Kiger helps produce the show, engaging with the audience on Facebook and LinkedIn. The show is produced by Digimentors. We produce high-quality virtual and hybrid events for organizations big and small around the world. We also do social and digital consulting, training, and workshops. Again, Dan Barry is our guest, live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimentors website. That's a bit of a preview of what's to come. We're going to review all of those stories. And as a reminder, PDFs, links to those stories and PDFs of those stories are on our website. You can find them at digimentors.group slash blog. So first, a good morning to Doug Levy, who I know usually joins us from uh, uh, California early, uh, 5.30 a.m. his time. Doug, thank you. Jonathan is joining us from the East Village. Always a pleasure to have you, Jonathan. And Somya is joining us. Uh, she's an intern at Digimentor. She's filling in for Paula Kiger helping to share links and provide context on Facebook for you. Miriam Berkeley is joining from Hell's Kitchen. Miriam, thank you for joining us. And Pam, Pam maybe, McNerney is saying hi to Dan. She's watching from the shoreline in Connecticut. We'll ask Dan about her when he joins us on the program. Patricia Freudenberg is joining us from Long Island, New York. Uh, thank you, as always. And Patricia is watching on LinkedIn. As a reminder, we're live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, 
and our DigiMentors website. Linda Lawrence is also watching from Long Island. And our friend Stefan Kaplan is watching from New Jersey, uh, as is Jonah. Uh, Jonah is saying hi to Dan, a neighbor of his in Maplewood, New Jersey. Dan, your friends are turning out for this show. It's really great to have all of you with us. So with that, we're going to bring on our host, Sri Srinivasan. Sri, thank you for joining us. Of course. Hi, Neil. Great to be with all of you and wonderful to see the family, the read along family together. And we are so excited about having Dan Barry. Dan is such a wonderful writer, storyteller, columnist. Everyone should tune in. Please share this with your friends. Just tag them right now on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or LinkedIn, or hit share or retweet, and they can watch live or can join us later It'll play immediately on the same channels as soon as we are off the uh, off the air. So please tell your friends this is going to be a wonderful program. And there's so much news going on, and we'll be covering that, talking about Dan's career, as well as reading uh, parts of the paper with him. We've been doing this now for seven years, reading the Sunday New York Times, and the idea is to share our love of newspapers with you but also to get a sense of uh, what's it like to read the paper with someone who knows the paper well, in this case, Dan Barry. Before we bring Dan on, we're just gonna give you a quick preview of uh, what's happening in the paper, and then we'll bring Dan on to join us. And so we are going to start by uh, giving you a sense of what's in the paper today, and we will be able to uh, show you the front pages, the front page, and then we'll just look at all the different sections. And I will definitely be asking Dan uh, if he thought newspapers would still exist like this. Uh, if he, what is his prediction for how long we'll get this kind of newspaper? Neil, go ahead. We're, we're not getting the New York Times cam. Oh, um, so strange. Yeah, I'm turning it on and off here. That's that's. We, so I odd. think we saw it for just a moment, and then. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why. Can, I'm not sure what's, uh, not what's coming, going on with that. Um, uh, just, just a second. Yeah, because I see it. I, I you see, see it, it clearly in, there. Yeah, I see it here. Um, that's do you, really do you need me to bring it up uh, on my end and uh, we'll flip through? Sure. You, you um, tell me. Yeah. You, can still, you can still uh, uh, run the show and I'll just uh, flip through the paper here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry sure. about that, folks. Tech. Tech issues, you never know when they'll happen. Uh, here's the front page, uh, the striking image there you see of uh, the US and Netherlands game uh, right on there. Uh, at Tyler Adams, US captain after his team was eliminated from the World Cup in a 3-1 loss to the Netherlands on Saturday. I hope many of you are following as I, uh, as I am the World Cup. This was a good run. Uh, by the U.S., but they were clearly outmatched by the Netherlands. Not a surprise. Uh, much higher, more qu higher quality team with more experience. Uh, the lead story here: you see, worsening debt in poor nations threatens crisis. Looming default risk. Lenders are slow to help. World Bank warns of lost progress. And um, the next story there you see is he set Russian free. For Kiev, that's treason and chaos of war. Lines for civilians blur. And that's Jeffrey Gettleman reporting from Ukraine. Uh, also on the front page is Beijing's bargain with its people is shaken, swapping freedom for prosperity, but they may get neither. This is uh, such a surprise to so many people because we haven't seen anything like this since Tiananmen Square. And uh, uh, we are now looking at the below the fold. Uh, for many black voters, Walker's troubles mar historic moment. And uh, this is about the uh, very important race happening between Reverend Raphael Warnock, the Democratic candidate and incumbent, and Herschel Walker, Republican and sports uh, star who uh, has been uh, caught in an enormous number of lies and problems in recent, uh, in recent weeks. Uh, and then offshore power finds rich foe in oil country is 
is the story here by David Gellis, who was a guest on the New York Times Read Along. And you can find our entire archives on our YouTube page, or if you go to digimentors.group, there's a New York Times Read Along button that you can look at. Let's look at quickly some of the other sections. And uh, the Sunday opinion cover is World War Through Begins with Forgetting. The last generation that remembers the reality of full-scale global war is disappearing. Does that mean we will stumble into catastrophe? Great question. Uh, and uh, uh, another striking image there. Let's keep going. Let's see the Sunday business cover is he's the bad boy of the chess world. Did he cheat? This is about uh, the American who has been accused of uh, cheating in, in chess. And so it's interesting to see that as a Sunday business cover and not, say, the sports cover. Uh, Sunday Styles is Finding Calm in Chaos. And Greta Gerwig is back with White Noise, now in theaters, and Barbie, which she directed and is finished editing. And the Arts and Leisure cover is for big pictures, few originals. Uh, Hollywood star making machinery isn't churning out next generation Tom Cruise's. It's a crisis, and the movies know it. Of course, Tom is, has no plans to leave the stage. If you caught Maverick this year, you'll see he hasn't aged a bit. Let's see what other sections we have. Uh, this is a really unusual uh, special section. Uh, it has two covers. One is called Embrace the Cold. And then if you flip it, it says, ta-da, Escape the Cold. So the front one is about getting a beach. One is about a beach vacation and another is getting a cold vacation uh, here in the U.S., although they tell you to go to Quebec as one of the one of the ideas. So that's a fun cover. And, and three, it's actually, you don't have to flip it. If you look at it this way, you just have to open it up and then you see the, the back section. Oh, nice. The way that they designed it. Nice. That's yeah, very good design. That's excellent. And uh, the Times T magazine, which is their style magazine. Altogether now it's 9 p.m. and dinner is served from Tokyo to New Orleans. A lot of places in the world eat dinner much later than Americans do. Um, it, Amer Indian Americans or Americans, when we go to India, we might eat a meal before we go to dinner because dinner is often not served till 10 o'clock at a dinner party. And the book review cover is uh, uh, about... Holiday uh, books. Yeah, it's all the holiday books. Yep, there you go. And uh, that's always great. And the Times Magazine is my journey to the corrugated core of the 21st century economy. Boxed in by Matthew Scher. This is about all the boxes in the digital world. Lots of packages still being shipped. So, folks, there's your preview of the New York Times Magazine and the New York Times Sunday edition. And with that, we'll have a chance now to talk about all of this with Dan Barry. Our guest uh, is Dan, who is a longtime columnist and writer at the New York Times. Uh, he's a multiple award-winning journalist, including the Pulitzer Prize, the George Polk Award, and much more. And he's a friend of the show, and we're just so glad that we can have him on. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Dan. Uh, we always start the show by asking how you're doing and uh, how you're spending your Sunday, apart from this, getting up so early for us. Um, I'm fine physically. I'm confused mentally but that's usual. I'm actually in the Hartford, outside of Hartford, Connecticut in Bloomfield um, last night. Um, there was a reunion of um, reporters from my first newspaper and we've been getting together in the holiday season now almost for 40 years. So last night this house was filled with reporters and retired reporters and it was great, it was wonderful. What was it like to see uh, your colleagues, uh, and to see this journey that you've been on and they've been on? Uh, yeah, I, I'm just, uh, we worked at a newspaper called the Journal Inquirer in uh, Manchester, Connecticut. And uh, it was a small newspaper, kind of a known as a bulldog newspaper. And it was always, you know, uh, nipping at the heels of the Hartford Current. And so uh, when you work at a small paper like that, uh, bonds are created. And Fortunately for me, uh, these bonds have lasted for decades now, and we've <clears throat> seen one another, you know, marry or or develop relationships, have children. There was a grandchild here last night, 
Um, so, uh, you know, a, a, a wonderful little uh, newspaper in Manchester brought together all these people and we still get together. Yeah, Pem is asking us, was it a long night? <laughs> <laughs> no, Pem, Pem left early enough, so she, she behaved. Uh, uh, Pem worked with me as well at the Journal Inquirer. She's a wonderful friend. She's, she's a journalist as well. Uh, excellent. And uh, there's Jonah. You want to say hi to Jonah? Jonah. Uh, is it Jonah? Zimilis. Zimilis, yeah. He, he and his wife run um, the independent bookstore in downtown Maplewood. And it's uh, not only uh, a great uh, bookstore in Essex County. It's one of the best in the region, if not the country. It's well known and it attracts very fine authors consistently. Um, and it also um, is um, a leader in promoting um, uh, understanding and advocacy for people with disabilities. It's a wonderful, wonderful bookstore. David, <laughs> David Clinch, who is watching, says, love that Dan started in the local newspaper. The importance of local news cannot be underestimated. Absolutely true, David. And this is a moment for us to talk about local newspapers. Even though we read the New York Times here, there's really a celebration of print newspapers. and. Do you want to talk a little bit about that then? About local newspapers? Yes, yeah. Well, I, I actually wrote a story a, a couple of years ago about um, a small newspaper in uh, Pennsylvania. And it was uh, like many smaller newspapers, many larger newspapers as well. It was uh, bought up uh, by a, a, a private equity group or a hedge fund, Alden Global Capital. And, um, you know, the um, those newspapers over the years have been bled dry. And so at the end of the day, this newspaper, um, the Mercury in uh, Pottsville, Pennsylvania, um, had literally one reporter covering this fairly large town. And uh, his, his commitment to his role in the community was really quite moving because he saw himself as having almost a civic responsibility to inform the electorate. You know, there's nothing worse for a democracy than to have an uninformed electorate. And uh, there it is, um, uh, Evan Brandt, uh, you know, a hero. You, you know, most people would not know who Evan Brandt is, but I assure you this morning he is going to some community event in the town in which he lives and trying to keep his neighbors and the community aware of what's happening around them. Thank you. So, so important. And Pradnya asked about the bookstore's name and it's called Words Bookstore. Words Bookstore. I'm sorry. Yeah. So everyone, please. Now I'm not going to be allowed back in because I forgot to say words. <laughs> no, but you gave them a great plug. And Jonah <laughs> says, uh, thanks for your kind words, Dan. I'm a Kamalimba business alum and enjoyed meeting you at an alumni event, social media. That was some time ago, Jonah. Thank you so much. And uh, Sujana says, uh, shout out to local booksellers, including Wachung Booksellers in Montclair, New Jersey, also Essex County. Yeah, the, the idea of independent bookstores and small newspapers, independent newspapers, all seem to tie, uh, tie together. And, uh, you know, we see, you saw the New York Times arrayed on my desk here, uh, Dan, and you can see that it's thriving and we read about how well it's doing. Uh, what is your message to uh, journalists who are at newspapers that are not doing as well, uh, regional papers, smaller papers? Um, I would say I feel your pain. Uh, I think it's a very, very difficult time for uh, reporters who are working at smaller newspapers that are uh, not, not being funded properly. Um, there are friends of mine who were at this party last night who are really like trying to to serve that purpose of informing the public uh, with diminishing resources. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. I used to work at the Providence Journal. I'm so proud to have worked at the Providence Journal. And um, it's it had hundreds of reporters and editors when I was there in the in the uh, early 90s. And that's not the case now. Um, and I don't know what that means for how Rhode Island, which used to be, you know, it used to be it, Rhode Island is a, a contained community. And, and, you know, if you if you live in Wesley, you know, someone in, in Providence or Woonsocket, it's 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 always a couple of de degrees of separation. 
now I don't, I'm not sure where, where people are getting their news uh, from as the Providence Journal struggles to stay around through the hard work of people like Kathy Hill and uh, Tom Mooney and so many other friends of mine. Yeah, we're always cheering for the smaller newspapers and we've done uh, various uh, read-alongs with uh, other newspapers as well. And so folks, if you're new to this show, uh, uh, on Sundays and Sunday mornings, we read the New York Times with a great guest and we talk about their work and career and we read the paper with them and get their uh, thoughts as we're flipping through the paper. Uh, before we get to the paper today, what well, we thought it would be nice to uh, just talk about some uh, of the articles that are your favorites over the years. And here's a comment from Barbara who says, good morning from some Entenmann's fans in Boston. And uh, that's one of the stories that we will be talking about. So maybe we can start there. Why this Entenmann's connection? And this is an article that you wrote recalling a sweet slice of Long Island life. Well, um, I, I grew up on Long Island. And uh, when I was a kid, um, if there were, uh, it was a wedding or a wake or a communion or a confirmation, um, there was always an Entenmann's involved. There was always an Entenmann's on the top of the refrigerator. And uh, there was some local pride in Entenmann's because I lived on the South Shore of Long Island and the, and the massive bakery for Entenmann's was only a few miles away. And so, uh, you know, it's one of those um, touchstones in our lives. Uh, you know that it's not actually all that good for you. Uh, it may not even be a very good baked good, but there's something about it that over the years has brought you together with your friends and your family. It's a, it's a salve at the end of a long day or you know, the first thing you have in the morning. And um, so um, the, one of the founders, and a guy with a surname of Entenmann, died. And I saw it as, you know, a, um, a, a, a hook or a way to do a kind of essayish riff on the importance of things like this in our lives. And of course, you're, you're really good at those essay-ish riffs and the essays themselves. Uh, since we're a global show, we should tell everyone that Entenmann's is a brand of baked goods that uh, you can get in stores that have nothing that are not bakeries and so that's one of the reasons they're ready-made packaged right. uh, grocery stores and elsewhere you can just pick up cookies or uh, various kinds of cakes and Linda says that was a great and memorable uh, article and uh, you're right there will be people who will dispute the quality and the taste of this but they will this is such a, a big ubiquitous brand in the US yeah. Uh, I will say, I will say, Sri, that, you know, I've been at the paper, I've been at the New York Times for 27 years. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes they forget I'm there and they just keep paying me. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, that story, for some reason, touched a nerve around the country and it, it got a huge reaction. And so uh, my obituary will say something along the lines of Dan Barry, who wrote about intimates for the New York Times in 2022. Ba, ba, ba. Well, the, the, that'll be part of what it says. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh well, uh, great. Let's uh, let's talk about another story. One small step for democracy in a live free or die town. Right. Um, the New York Times was focused and is focused on um, democracy. You know, this question, you know, it's sort of like wither democracy at this time. And uh, uh, I would imagine that many of us listening uh, would agree that at times uh, it seemed as though uh, our concept of democracy was being tested in the last year or two or four or five. And um, editors and reporters have been looking for stories that kind of illuminate this thought. <clears throat> and... Um, and I was asked to try and find a story or two um, along these lines, just something that generally touched on the on the issue of democracy. And um, uh, an editor saw a reference to what was happening in Croydon 
And uh, we agreed that I'd go up there for a few days and, and find out what was happening. And, and very quickly, um, in, in many towns in New England, they, uh, the process is to have an annual town meeting. Uh, sometimes they're binding, sometimes they're not. In the case of Croydon, they're binding. And that's where the, 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 um, the residents of the town gather together once a year and they will effectively pass the town budget and the town's uh, school budget. And so in Croydon, uh, Croydon is in New Hampshire, and over the last 20 years, there's been a movement um, uh, to uh, a libertarian-oriented um, organization called or group called the Free State Project, and they've been gravitating toward New Hampshire with hopes of having some control over the uh, over the governance of the state, and therefore, um, you know, I, I suppose. Um, winning or securing more individual rights. And this is causing some tension within New Hampshire. So there was a free stater who was on the local um, town council effectively. And um, the annual town meeting took place. And this is where uh, we have to be careful about the sanctity of democracy. Very few people showed up for the annual town meeting. And this uh, free state um, uh, councilman uh, took advantage and said, <clears throat> why don't we cut the school budget in half from 1.7 million to about 850,000 or something like that. And because there were so few people at the meeting, this devastating um, suggestion passed and it was binding. And so now this small town had to figure out what to do. Uh, how would they provide educational services to their children with half the budget? So this caused uh, quite a lot of self-reflection in, in Croydon, as well as a lot of anger. And um, it was determined that there was, a, there was a, a, an avenue in which you could do a redo um, if you got enough people to sign a petition saying, we'd like to do a redo. And it was you know, more than half the electorate in Croydon. And <clears throat> the people managed to do that. And then they, they did the meeting again, and this time the school budget passed. And so it was really like a come to Jefferson moment. Like if you're going to have a democracy or, or a, a democratic grounded kind of government, you have to show up, you have to participate. Um, it's not easy and it's not free. And that was the message that came out of Croydon, New Hampshire. That also touched a nerve nationally, that story. And, uh, of course, we're seeing not just as, as, as here, let's use a comment from Ellen says, democracy isn't being just tested. It's being assaulted, challenged, tossed off. One of the stories that you may have seen this week is that uh, pres former President Trump said something about rescinding the Constitution and you know things like that. That's the stage we're in right now of what's happening in this country. And it's so yeah. difficult to kind of understand. I, I, I don't think that's going to happen, by the way. I don't think we're going to rescind the Constitution. I'm not a constitutional scholar, but I don't think that's going to happen. Well, let's hope not. But this is, I mean, the fact that it's even a conversation well, by a former president uh, is, is right. definitely not, it shows you we're in a different place. Before we go to other stories, there's still comments coming in about Entenmann's. Uh, Linda says, I still remember my mother yelling at me when I brought home the more expensive Entenmann's brand of cake instead of the store brand. And Pratnya says, but the Entenmann's pound cake is still the best is what she says, and I've had that uh, multiple times. Uh, lots of great conversation happening, folks. Please tag your friends, hit you know, hit share, uh, forward this to a friend. They can watch us live now or uh, watch as the replay as soon as we're off the air. Uh, let's go to another story. The case of jo Jane Doe Ponytail, an epic tragedy on a small <coughs> block of Queens. Right. This... Uh... This is a far cry from talking about Entenmann's. <laughs> um, sh shall I talk about this story? Please, please. Yeah, and you, we, we're showing the unusual design and kind of a wraparound it's a story. Beautiful, beautiful design. Um, the the designers, uh, you know, Wayne Camadoy. I can't say enough about Wayne and Fred Bierman, uh, the, those guys in the print hub. 
uh, overseen by Tom Jolly now. I mean, it's unbelievable what they do. It's art. It really is art. And also the photography is by uh, Todd Heisler. And Todd and I have worked on many, many stories over the years. And uh, not only is he a brilliant photojournalist, he's just a good guy to travel with. Um, so just in um, case it's not obvious to people watching, this is basically it ran here and then the cover, it, it, there was also on the other side, right? So this was this is what we're looking right. at. This this entire right. thing was, the, was this image. And, and the uh, this story is about um, um, a, um, an undocumented uh, woman from China who made her way to ch from China to to Queens, and Queens is is among the most diverse places in the entire world. Um, hundreds of languages being spoken in the borough of Queens. And she found herself there and um, she wound up working um, uh, in a massage parlor, which is, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a form of um, <clears throat> sex work in, in Queens, in Flushing. And um, the way I got onto it was um, uh, I, I read newspapers. I read newspapers, lots of newspapers, and not just the New York Times. And there was a small, small, maybe 100, 200 word story in one of the New York tabloids. And it, it, its headline said something like, Prosty jumps to death or something like that. And I have to say, I was offended. Um, I never, I've been in newspapers for my entire adult life. I've never heard the term prosty, um, which apparently uh, they intended as a shorthand for prostitute. And I just thought like a woman um, falling out of a window to her death. Um, and that's how we remember her. And uh, I was offended and I wanted to know more. I wanted to more fully realize who this young woman was. And so um, a great freelance reporter named Jeff Singer, who is fluent in Mandarin, and I spent um, the better part of a year in Flushing, Queens on uh, 40th Road, trying to find out more about this woman, her circumstances, where she came from. Uh, we documented her brother's search for the truth. Her brother and her mother came over from China in their grief to figure out what happened to their their um, their beloved Song Yang. And, uh, you know, it, it's not a happy story. It's not a happy ending, um, but it was um, uh, revelatory to me about uh, how people live and, um, and uh, a part of the city that I think most of us wouldn't really know or understand because if we ever go there we're only passing through to go to a restaurant answers to that story yeah that's her brother um so he came over for about a year he believed that the police had killed his um his sister um and we Jeff and I worked extremely hard to determine whether that was the case. Um, there was no evidence whatsoever. She either fell or jumped out of a window. Um, and, and sadly, that's, that's what happened. And so after this story ran, um, uh, maybe a few months later, uh, he, was, he collected his uh, sister's cremated remains and... Uh, and he went back to China with, with her. Ken saying that tabloid shorthand headlines have long been cruel, tacky, and grotesque. And <clears throat> well, you know, there's an art to it. I, you know, um, some, some tabloid headlines are iconic and extremely well done. And there really is a, a skill to trying to capture a complicated story in a few words, particularly in a tabloid setting. And so, on the other hand, sometimes it's a, an avenue to be exploitative and, uh, and as you say, uh, it can lend toward cruelty, yeah. You had said nice things about Wayne's work, and this is Wayne Camadoy, who's a former guest on the show and friend of the show. Your powerful words 
bring out our best design work. Uh, go on with you. <laughs> Sri, I, I do want to, since we have Wayne's comment up, uh, I do want to give a shout out to Wayne for all of his support for our show and to let folks know that uh, when I told him that Dan was going to be on the show and we identified some of the articles we'd be talking about, within half an hour, even though he was doing World Cup coverage on Saturday morning, he sent me all the PDFs for Dan's stories and then some. Uh, I think Wayne is the vice president of the Dan Barry <laughs> fan club. I claim no. presidency. Um, no. you know, but I, I have to say um, there's uh, people often ask me, what's the best part of journalism? And I have to say it is the, it, it is the collaboration. And at the New York times, you're working with the very best in, in this profession. So uh, Todd and I will go out on a story, uh, spend, hours on the streets of uh, Flushing, and then we'll, we'll go to a restaurant and, and kind of decompress and talk about what we just experienced. And it's so, it's so exciting to say, did you notice this? Did you hear that? What do you make of that? And then to go back to the newsroom and try to work it all out and work with the likes of, of Wayne and Fred. It's, and and this, this story was edited by uh, the late Christine Kay, and she was just an absolutely brilliant, brilliant editor and a wonderful person. And so when I think about Jane Doe Ponytail, even though it's a very somber story, uh, I have fond memories of working with with all these people, Todd and Jeff and Wayne and, and, and uh, lovely Christine. So I, I don't know many viewers uh, might not realize how how collaborative it is and how respectful it is in the New York Times when you're working with people who are the very best at what they do. It's so nice to hear. We can see the end product of that, but it's so oh, nice. look, just look at it. Just look at what what Wayne put together with with Todd's imagery. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's very powerful stuff. All right, uh, folks, we're talking to Dan Barry, the longtime columnist and writer at the New York Times. We are looking through some of his favorite stories, and then we will read the paper with him. And please feel free to ask questions of Dan, and we'll bring them to him. Uh, our next story here is called Ireland Wanted to Forget, But the Dead Don't Always Stay Buried, The Lost Children of Tuam. Yeah, um, I don't know if these are my favorite stories uh, because most of them are quite sad. I'm glad we did Entenmann's to bring some levity to, to the to the morning. Um, uh, my mother, my mother was from Ireland. She was from County Galway, and so I've been over to Ireland many times, and you know uh, I have many close ties uh, over there, and. Um, and two colleagues of mine, um, Cassie Bracken, a brilliant video journalist, um, and Megan Specia, who is on the international desk and spent an appreciable amount of time in Ukraine recently, um, had come upon this. And they were trying to figure out what to do with this story about um, uh, as many as 800, um, the, the remains of 800 children found in on the grounds of an old mother and baby home in in County Galway in, in a town called Choom. And so it wound up that uh, uh, we went over there. Cassie and I went over there and spent a lot of time there. And uh, in short, what happened is that Ireland, uh, when it was uh, when the free state was created in the early 1920s, um, these rebels who had effectively wrested wrested Ireland from England um, had to come up with a government. They had to figure this out. And so they dealt with a lot of um, uh, bureaucratic issues and they basically handed off the, the many of the social issues to the Catholic church or to, to churches, mostly Catholic in Ireland. And uh, with government funding, um, they created institutions called mother and baby homes. And these were where um, un wed women, uh, unwed pregnant women would go um, to um, 
give birth and then stay for about a year to nurse their child. And then <clears throat> they would be forced to leave and the child would remain behind and the child would be there, say, until five, six or seven years of age. And the child would either be um, adopted or fostered out or sent off to an industrial school. So it, it um, and this, this, this practice lasted for most of the 20th century. Um, and um, it's, it's tough. It's a, it's a, a representative of the kind of uh, repressive uh, moralistic attitudes that, that, that kind of uh, were in the air in Ireland at that time. And so um, the long and short of it is that a, a local woman in the town of Chum was doing some research. She was interested in genealogy and she was trying to write a, you know, a feature story for a local historical journal. And she was going to write about the mother and baby home and the, and the good nuns who took care of these, these women. And uh, she came upon some difficult math. She found that there had been almost 800 children who had died while, in the, while at this uh, institution, but she couldn't find any burial records for them, which is confounding. So she kept looking, going through cemeteries in the area and uh, the county offices. And then she came to the conclusion that they were actually buried on the grounds of the old home. The old home had been knocked down and now it's a playground actually. It was a playground for children. And she figured out that the remains of other children were, were below, uh, probably in a disused uh, sewage system in the chambers of a disused sewage system. And she was roundly ridiculed for this, this, um, this notion um, that this were the case. Um, and uh, finally, some um, forensic archaeologists were sent to the site to see whether this woman, who's an amateur historian, she, she, she was a farm wife, basically, uh, whether this, this uh, amateur historian was onto something. And uh, they began digging, and they found juvenile human remains. And so this story um, is about that woman's journey. Her name is Catherine Corliss. And uh, 10 years ago, no one knew who she was. She was living just outside of Chum. Uh, she was struggling with uh, depression and panic attacks and finding some kind of distraction in, in local genealogical research. Now she's a national hero. <clears throat> She's a national hero for having exposed what happened in Chum, which has prompted a, <clears throat> excuse me, a national uh, self-reckoning of how um, women were treated, were treated in Ireland, um, the misogyny that ran through the system for most of the 20th century. Um, so that's what this story is about, her journey, the historical um, um, background to mother and baby homes and what it means to the Ireland of today. Thank you. Such a moving, <clears throat> important story. And folks, you can find the PDF, of this and the other articles we've talked about with Dan on our website. If you go to digimentors.group right. and you will see there, there's a blog section and you will be able to find all of these articles. So please go to digimentors.group slash blog and you'll see it. Before we go to one more. Wait, sweet. So you see that photograph that's up yeah. now. So that's a historical photograph. This is just another thing about the New York Times. And by the way, Wayne also did the layout for this special section, mm -hmm. Wayne and Fred. Um, that photograph, when we received it, um, was reversed. So uh, the, the, uh, the smaller boy was on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. And behind them was some... Uh, writing, and we couldn't figure out what it was. Um, and a, a, a photo editor at the Times named Craig Allen looked at it and figured it out that what the, the what we had received was was in reverse. And he flipped it, and now what's behind them is 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 in English and 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 uh, readable. So that was that's just one example of how great it is to work at the times. Like we couldn't figure it out for, for weeks, if not months. 
And then he kept looking at it and he figured it out. And that's the kind of attention to detail that journalists oh, yeah. uh, can. That would have been embarrassing to have, have that photo in reverse. So. And you know there will be somebody who would have uh, pointed that out. <laughs> yeah. that way. Yep. Uh, folks, before we read one more story from Dan, we yeah. wanted to just share with you a piece of breaking news that the New York Times sent out breaking news alert about uh, development in Iran. As you know, there have been tremendous protests over the last several weeks in Iran against uh, the morality police and what has happened there. And Iran has abolished the morality police uh, after months of protests. Now, this doesn't mean that everything is uh, going to be improved immediately for the women of Iran, but this is being cautiously welcomed. And uh, the hijab law is being re-examined. Doesn't mean that it will go away, but this is still progress and a response, direct response to what has been happening. And this is, of course, Dan, why we like to show this is in addition to the news value, this is how the modern newspaper is, right? You have the website and the newspaper working together. All right, let's take a look at one more story. The lost men, the men lost to 20 Bruckner Boulevard. They were transforming a century old Bronx ice house into a charter school. It became one of the deadliest construction sites in New York City in almost two decades. Um, I, I think that um, anyone who spends any time in New York City uh, will notice uh, the scaffolding up around the buildings and so on. And I think it's true in New York and in cities across the country, there are these workers building our cities and repairing our buildings. And, uh, and many of them are um, uh, from Central and South America and uh, more than a few are undocumented. And they become almost, um, you know, and this is on us, become almost in, invisible. We don't really pay attention. And, and uh, this is also a story about the importance of unions, by the way. Um, and so uh, that's true in New York. You know, if you, if you go to the seven train um, cutting through Queens at, you know, six in the morning, you're going to see hundreds of men and women in work uh, uh, apparel going to build our city or to clean our buildings and what have you. So this this is about um, uh, pausing and saying, well, who are these people and what are they doing on our behalf? Um, there was a building going up on Brooklyn Boulevard in the Bronx. It's kind of a famous building. It was an old ice house, um, but it became kind of iconic in New York City because it had um, the History Channel um, uh, um, advertisement on top of it. And you would always see it if you were on the Cross Bronx or if you were on the Harlem River Drive, you would see this big History Channel sign. It's now since changed, but it became known as that. And so some developers uh, bought the building and they were and they were uh, fitting it out to become ultimately a charter school. But uh, in the course of that, um, men were dying. Like, this is crazy. So three men um, died and a fourth was gravely injured all within the span of less than less than three years. That's an astounding rate. So it's it's uh, uh, the story is pointing out how how difficult this is uh, uh, construction word how how dangerous it is, particularly if not proper um, uh, practices are in place, uh, safety practices and 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 measures, and. Um, yeah, in 2018, an 18-year-old boy man named Marco Martinez, um, he was in the country for less than six months. He dies. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that was in the newspaper, okay? Then a few months later, a guy who had been in prison named Michael Daves, um, um, uh, he, he had a history of substance abuse. Um, he fell through a hole and died. And then um, maybe a year later, a year or so later, uh, two men are on an elevator. Um, one, uh, Mauricio Sanchez, he's from Mexico, <clears throat> and the other, Yonan Pineda, 
he's from Guatemala, uh, they get on an elevator on the fifth floor of this building and they, they have a, a barrel of construction debris and uh, the elevator uh, breaks and they go hurtling to the ground. Um, in telling this, and, and, and Mr. Sanchez was crushed to death and Mr. Pineda miraculously lived and so uh, we um, got onto this. I had heard about it. And actually, the, the, the person who told me about it only knew about two of the deaths. The person didn't even know about the third death. And so um, um, a wonderful reporter named Karen Zrake and I spent a few months trying to piece together what happened and, more importantly, who these men were. And... Uh, and uh, since Mr. Pineda was still alive, we met with him several times. And uh, I'm always thinking about how do you, how do you draw the reader in? Uh, how do you get the reader to care? If you look at the New York Times front page today, there are six stories. They're all competing for your attention and they're all important. And so uh, I'm always thinking about, well, how do I get the reader to care about my story and to feel this experience um, of Yonan Pineda and Mauricio Sanchez. And so Mr. Pineda uh, had described getting on the elevator with Mauricio that fateful day and then having it plummet to the ground. And that's how we begin the story. We try to put the reader in the elevator with these two men. You can just see them covered with dust. There's a big barrel of construction debris. And, uh, and then, and then as, the, as Yonan told us, uh, it felt as though um, the floor disappeared beneath their feet. And with any luck, you care now. You, you've been in that elevator. You, you feel that fear. And um, now, you're, now you're invested in the stories of these men. Oh, another powerful story from Dan Barry. Uh, he, he's pointing out these are not necessarily his favorite stories, but some of the memorable ones uh, in a mix of, of pain and the kind of work that journalists do so well in highlighting problems uh, in our society, as well as some more fun stories uh, as well. So Dan, we're going to now take a look at the, uh, the look at the paper. But before we do, I just want to ask you about uh, any of your current projects that you're willing to talk about. Um, sure. I, um, I went back to Ireland a couple of months ago um, to see whatever happened um, to that case in Chum. So Ireland discovers juvenile human remains in a disused sewage tank in a playground in County Galway. And well, whatever happened, um, what did they do? What did the country do? And what has Catherine Corliss been doing since then? So it turns out that uh, her, um, her, uh, her crusade hasn't ended. She's still trying to find justice for these, these uh, babies and children who died while in the care of both the Catholic Church and the Irish government. Thank you. And looking forward to seeing uh, your follow up from uh, another lighthearted piece. So <laughs> we're looking forward to seeing that, uh, seeing that follow up and we will tell our viewers about it for sure. Uh, let's see who's watching. Chris Gorman's watching from Manhattan. Ken Fisher is watching from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And Eric is watching from Ottawa. Uh, hi, Eric. Thanks for watching. Jonah, who we discussed earlier from the Words Bookstore, uh, says, it's the first time he's seeing this program. I'm sorry I didn't know about it earlier. My father passed away at 93 this summer and was a devoted fan of the New York Times uh, with failing eyesight who struggled to read the paper. I'll try to get the word out to this population and others. And in fact, uh, you know, first of all, Jonah, thank you for uh, commenting here and may your father's memory be a blessing. We have uh, other folks whose family members may not be able to read as well. And they, there was a folks, some of the folks who were early watchers of the show so they could kind of listen to it as almost like a radio program and get a sense of uh, the newspaper as, as well. Well, folks, we're now gonna take a look at the print New York Times and uh, have Dan read it with us and uh, share his thoughts. We were having some tech difficulties earlier. Let's see if we can get it to work and it seems to be okay. Dan, on the cover, you can see the New York Times is leading with a photograph of the uh, US team's uh, adventures in the World Cup. Are you following the World Cup? 
Sure, and I watched that game. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the reporter who's written the story is Andrew Kay, and he sits next to me. Um, I, I'm assigned to the Metro staff, my editors in investigations, but I sit in the sports section. <laughs> and so he and I sit at the end of the of the room and uh he's a he's a wonderful guy and he's a great great reporter and uh, readers should know he's obviously writing this on deadline and you can feel uh and he's also writing for an international audience so he's not trying to be you know a homer you know he's trying to see it in its in its fullness and so you f you 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 feel the bittersweet moment for the united states but you understand that the Netherlands um, is going to move on. Um, and so Andrew deftly um, captures all those emotions. And my analysis of the game was that they had their chances, America did. And if you get a chance and you don't close the deal, then it's very difficult to, uh, you know, to, uh, to beat a team like the Netherlands, which is much more experienced and a better team. Yeah, I, I, I sadly, I agree with you. <laughs> Well, it's going to be the next World Cup is going to be in North America, the, shared between the U.S., uh, Canada, and Mexico. So that'll be a very interesting time. Uh, let's see. Just re-looking at the uh, if you have any comments about any of these stories, Dan, please uh, uh, chime in. Otherwise, we'll just keep looking. Worsening debt in poor nations threatens crisis. Uh, this is a World Bank uh, warns that lenders are slow to help uh, and. There's also a story from Kiev about uh, uh, how in the chaos of war, lines for civilians are blurred. <clears throat> Beijing story about Beijing's bargain with its people is shaken. And we're certainly seeing what happened in Iran just overnight, that uh, protests can matter, of mass protests on a, a national scale. And... Uh, for many black voters, Walker's Troubles Bar historic moment, uh, such an interesting uh, race down in Georgia, and it's going to help determine what happens in the Senate. The Democrats will retain control of the Senate, but how much they'll be able to do will be determined by uh, this particular seat. Offshore power finds rich foe in oil country, and this is a story by David Gellis, who of course, you know Dan as well, and he's also a former guest on the show. Sure. Let's go in here. They're always tweaking with the, the, this section of the Times, the A2 and 3. And uh, the headline, uh, there's a headline from history, last week's trending headlines, uh, and also facts of interest. And then looking at uh, tracking how one word has changed throughout the, the Times. And the word viral has changed, of course. Nowadays, it's much more associated with things uh, on the internet going viral and fame and popularity and things like that. And here's just a simple feature that helps people who want to know what to stream before they, these film, what films are leaving uh, Netflix in December. What is your sense of the balance, Dan, between kind of news and news you can use? Well, I, I wouldn't mind going back to the front page a little bit. Um, sure. I, I, you, you're right that that the Times has been trying to figure out what to do with pages two and three, and uh, I think they're, I think they're coming up with the proper calculus of, of uh, information and whimsy and uh, not being so um, somber all the times, um, all the time, trying to help people under. Uh, figure out how they might spend their afternoons or to think about a word, as you say, about viral. But uh, first of all, if you just look at the front page, so there are six stories. Uh, the first thing I notice is that uh, the, the paper costs $6. And I, you know, I've been around a long time, so I remember when it was considerably less than that. But then if you think about the $6 and then what that $6 gets you, and this is only one section of the Sunday Times. I'm not trying to be a, you know, a, 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 I'm not trying to sell newspapers for the New York Times. But even as even the disinterested observer would have to admit this is extraordinary stuff. So you have reports from from China, Ukraine, Qatar, and Atlanta right on the front page, and and 
uh, let's just take that Beijing story. If you look at it, uh, I don't know Vivian Wang, but I'm a fan. And if you notice in the third graph, she uses the first person. She says, but when I met him a few mo uh, months ago, she's talking about a man in this part of China that's now, you know, <laughs> in the, at the center of some civil unrest prompted, you know, uh, at least partly by uh, the COVID-19 restrictions. You know, that's a big, that's, you know, 20 years ago, you would not really see first person on the front page of the New York Times. Now, um, I don't find that intrusive, okay? Uh, some reporters might find that intrusive. And one of the reasons that, that it's done sometimes is they've, they've found that people don't really understand what a dateline is, that people have forgotten that a dateline means that the reporter was actually in this place. So, so um, Vivian Wang was in this part of China. And so sometimes it's a signal to the reader who might not understand datelines that yes, Vivian was here and she's in the throes of this, of this uh, situation. Um, so that's, I think the that Times would say something like uh, a New York Times reporter met with this person in, in this kind right, of third so person right. Uh, right. way that was also confusing. Uh, right. I, I, and, you know, sometimes maybe that's the better way to go. Sometimes it might be up to the, 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 um, the, the gut feeling of the reporter and the editor about how the story is being presented. But clearly Vivian and her editor said, no, let's use first person here because it brings immediacy to it. And also it's, you know, you can use first person and still isn't about you. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's about the story and it's not about you. You're signaling to the reader that you're simply the Virgil in the place. And so, yes, I'm here. And now let me tell you the story. Sure. Um, and, and so, but by the way, that's a, that's a, a particularly well done story by Vivian. Um, and also I would recommend the story by Jeffrey Gettleman. I, he, he was on Metro uh, with me for a brief while. And then he went on to much greener pastures while I stayed behind Metro on Metro. Um, and he's been all over the world. And that story is uh, about a, a local um, uh, man who um, has basically created kind of a, uh, I wouldn't say vigilante police force, but some kind of citizens group to try and maintain uh, control in a, a town that's been effectively blown up by the Russians and then left, left behind by the Russians. And they come upon uh, a Russian pilot who stumbles into their midst after, after, uh, some some uh, warfare, and well, what do you do with this guy? He's your prisoner, but what do you do with him? And uh, this guy, who who is basically, for lack of a better term, the, the town mayor at this moment, decides to turn him over to the Russians because they they don't they don't have the capacity they don't know what to do with him. And so now this guy is being tried for treason. And so uh, what Jeffrey is so good at, and so is Megan Speech and so many others is to put uh, flesh and bone on in, in, in stories about war. You know, it's not only, you know, this building was blown up and these many people were killed. It's about slowing it down in the moment and, and the complexities um, that are uh, brought to the fore by war. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Folks, we're talking to Dan Barry. We have about 25 minutes with him, and we're just going to flip through the paper. And we're, I'm learning so much, as I'm sure you are as well. Please tag your friends. They can watch us now, or they can uh, join the recording of this, which will run on all of these channels, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn, as soon as we're off the air. There's also on our website, digimentors.group, and we have some links there to memorable stories by Dan Barry that you can check out. Uh, this is the international section. Deadly disaster turns Italy's focus to illegal construction. We were just talking about construction issues in New York, and this is a worldwide problem. Of course, we learned about everything in Qatar as well. And here's a story from India, a march across India with democracy at risk. This is the leader of the opposition of India competing with Narendra Modi. This is Rahul Gandhi and competing with uh, Narendra Modi. 
Mr. Gandhi is going on a remarkable walk across India to re kind of revive his party. Uh, some of you who know your Indian history will remember the, the march by Mahatma Gandhi, no relation to this Gandhi, as he fought the British to bring attention to an unfair salt tax. And these are all, Dan, as we're seeing in, Ir in Iran, in China, in this in India, just efforts to get attention to the things that you were protesting, that you're trying to get attention to is so difficult. Um, one dead as huge wave hits cruise ship. And cruising is back despite the pandemic and everything. Uh, Diana, who's watching from San Francisco, from this Bay Area, hi, Diana, says, I love first person accounts like Wong did. It helps bring the story to life. I feel connected. This is about Vivian's story about what's happening in Beijing. After years of fanning COVID fears, Beijing must now try to ally, uh, allay the fears as well. Uh, unusual story, Dan, you may have caught this, that on Chinese television, they're not showing reaction shots of the crowd whenever they can avoid it because they don't want people to see that elsewhere in the world, while China's completely shut down, people are gathering in these spectacles. And uh, so they're using a 30 second delay to show close-ups of coaches instead of showing close-ups or showing shots of the crowd. Right. And also, it's very moving to, to read that the protesters are holding up blank pieces of paper yes. that say nothing, yet say everything. Here is Israeli journalists at World Cup get a chilly reception from Arab fans, despite signs of a thaw, a more hostile mood on the streets. So other angles to the Qatar story. Empty classes and jangled nerves in Idaho town after murders. This has been a story that's been perplexing in how it's unfolded about murders of multiple young students uh, in Idaho. I would say that a lot of your uh, listeners uh, know about that story about before uh, uh, murdered Idaho students. Um, and what's... Uh, I guess unnerving about it is it appears that the police have no idea what happened. Yeah, that's right. Uh, by the way, we're getting another shout out to Vivian's work. Love Vivian's work. This Ken Fisher, great Twitter follow too. So folks, uh, check her out. And of course, please follow Dan on Twitter. Uh, uh, he is terrific there. Uh, Dan, can you talk a little bit about the neediest cases as you understand it and uh, how important that is within the New York Times? We see this every year at this time. Yeah, it, you know, it goes back many, many years and uh, newspapers in New York and around the country back in the day uh, would have these, um, these efforts uh, to, uh, usually around holiday time. And of course, the need doesn't, uh, the, the need doesn't end after the holidays. That's one of the vexing uh, issues here. Um, but uh, newspapers like the New York Times would have um, these uh, altru altruistic efforts, you know, Santa's helper, or what have you. Uh, and so the New York Times has been doing it for, for forever. And over the years, they've enlisted reporters to do profiles of people who, who would be representative of those in need so that... Um, you, I, I've written stories for the neediest cases over the years so that you, uh, you understand um, uh, why a person is in circumstances such that they would need some help. And so uh, my wife, Mary Trinity, and I always give every year to the neediest cases. Um, and I think the New York Times is very uh, smart and devoted to this effort. Um, I'd recommend people to consider it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, this is a, going to be a relatively big story in politics. The Democratic Party is looking to move their primaries uh, in order so that more minorities, especially black folks, can have an earlier say in the primary process. As you know, Iowa and the caucuses, uh, the Iowa caucuses are first. And now that's going to change in South Carolina, where both Biden and uh, Obama made their uh, first big push are going to be earlier in the cycle. And that's going to be 
something that we'll see if it still has to be approved. But if that happens, that will shake up some of the thinking in the Democratic primaries. Yeah. And Iowa won't be happy. I will not be happy. That's correct. Uh, can you talk a little bit about obits, please? Uh, sure. Uh, I've written them. I, I, I've written them as well. I, I wrote the obituary for Jimmy Breslin, um, great journalist. Uh, you, you know, people like Marguerite Fox and Neil Gensler and and um, and Sam Roberts um, uh, understand that. Uh, a life is a story, right? So the New York Times uh, understand as well that lives are, not, are, are complicated and messy, but we're also a newspaper. And so there's always this um, balance in the New York Times to, to remember that this is a news story, yet at the same time being respectful of a life lived. And... Uh, what they have come up with over the years is that these obituaries are beautiful short stories oftentimes with with engaging beginnings and and wonderful endings they don't end with he is survived by oftentimes instead there's like a kicker that makes uh you feel as though you've known the person you've known what that person has gone through and uh it's like a, oftentimes the best of them read like O. Henry stories. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm sure many of your listeners read them even though they may not care about that person. They also focus on people who who mattered but aren't necessarily well known. They weren't like a, a bold faced name. Uh, those are my favorite. Uh, you know, there's, I think in, in today's editions, there's, um, there's an obituary for Freddie Roman uh, who was kind of a Catskill comedian known for his put downs. Um, and uh, uh, I love that, you know, that's so New York. And I used to work in the Catskills as a cocktail waiter um, at a resort. And uh, yeah, he's great. He was with the Friars Club for a long time. All right, uh, folks, we have about 20 minutes left with uh, Dan Barry. Please let us know if you have any comments or questions. We'd love to share I feel it. like an hour. So. <laughs> no, it's going too fast. I, I want to get even more time with you, Dan. Um, the business section cover uh, is uh, an interesting thing to see. It's kind of scandal in the chess world discussed here in the business cover. This is Hans Niemann, uh, the American prodigy, who has been accused yeah. of cheating. Yeah, I haven't read that story, but I'm eager to read it. Um, and. Uh, I can't remember whether chess used to be part of the sports section, uh, which I was thought was kind of funny. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that story in particular. New job seekers sh uh, shift their priority to stability. Interesting story there, and uh, and this is this is they've really gone to town on this. You can see how they've uh, you know three pages about this story. Uh, and uh, uh, and his uh, taking on and being accused of cheating by some of the biggest names in worldwide chess. All right, let's go to the opinion section. And uh, World War III begins with forgetting the last generation that remembers reality. The reality of full-scale global war is disappearing. Does that mean we will stumble into catastrophe? Again, the power of design on all of these sec front sections is really powerful and photography. Anything you'd like to say about the opinion section? And... No, uh, not necessarily. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a fan of, of many of the opinion writers. Um, uh, I thought, um, is it Michelle Cottle? Uh, her stuff is singular. I'm a huge fan of Maureen Dowd. I think today she writes about sepsis. Um, and um, a fellow I know, know named Kieran Staunton, who, who lost a son to sepsis. Um, uh, no, I, I think they've also broadened the voices. So it's, uh, it's quite diverse in, in, in the voices you uh, come across in that section. It's also, uh, in the old days, they wouldn't, they wouldn't really care very much about layout. 
but as you can see, you're, you're pointing out the beautiful graphics and um, it makes it much more um, uh, inviting, I think, the way they have it laid out and the, and the typeface now. And if you don't read the print section, you wouldn't know that now the editorial can move around. And here it is. You remember the op-ed section, right? The opposite the editorial. And now, uh, the well, editorial. That, you know, that's that's always the issue with uh, the difference between reading um, the newspaper on your um, mobile device or on your laptop, or having the actual print paper in your hand. Uh, what's lost by not reading it in print? I'm, you know, I'm. I read uh, digitally as well, but what's lost is serendipity. That's what's lost. Yeah. So your 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 eyes are drawn to one story, but then you'll notice another story on the same page or at the bottom of the page, and that'll take you down uh, uh, through an entirely different journey that you hadn't been in, uh, anticipating. When you're reading articles on your laptop, on your mobile phone, it's more dedicated, isn't it? So when I do research, uh, you know, looking at old newspapers on, um, say, times past, that's a great um, uh, way to spend your afternoon is to just go to 1924 <laughs> and start looking at the papers. Uh, and then suddenly you're reading about some weird little crime that happened in Brooklyn. Um, th that kind of serendipity is lost when you're reading it on your uh, mobile device. I'm flipping here through the book section and we want to tell folks that you're the author of multiple books, This Land, oh, America Multiple, Lost multiple books. A collection of his This Land columns. Yeah. Uh, the Boys in the Bunkhouse, Servitude and Salvation in the Heartland, published in 2016. Bottom of the 33rd, Hope, Redemption in Baseball's Longest Game. City Lights, a collection of his About New York columns. And Pull Me Up, a memoir in 2004. You were too young to write a memoir. Now, you know, it's time for volume two. Yeah. Uh, pull Me Up, uh, a good part of Pull Me Up centers around Entenmann's, by the way. <laughs> so, Sri, I, I wanted to jump in. You mentioned the baseball uh, uh, game, bottom of the 33rd. Uh, George Vesey is watching on our website, oh. and he left a comment there, uh, enjoying the great writer. And then uh, Hoops in Church Basement. Uh, Dan, I don't know if you're allowed to share what that's about, uh, but he said, find his epic baseball book, bottom of the 33rd. Um, so thank you, George. George is a former guest on our show, longtime sports writer for the New York Times. Uh, so thank you, George, for watching. Yeah, to, to, to be complimented by George Vesey about your sports writing, uh, I'm telling <laughs> you, it doesn't get any better than that. And and what he's referring to with, um, what was it, hopes in a church basement or hoops in hoops, a church basement? Yeah. Um, um, every Sunday, right about this time, I'm usually in um, a gymnasium playing basketball, and the gymnasium is, a, it's an old CYO gymnasium that's literally right next to the church. So while I'm playing basketball, nine o'clock mass is taking place on the other side of the wall. And so we have to watch our language. Um, so, but, but the point of that story, and it would, it would it resonate with George as well, is that, you know, the the, there is a sacredness in that kind of a game. Um, Sunday mornings with uh, people you know, just you know, trying to put a ball through a hoop and praying. <laughs> well, and and if we can take one more moment on that, you wrote a piece, um, a personal essay about uh, shooting hoops, um, and I remember uh, this was during COVID, if I'm not mistaken, and right. I I think I remember the picture on your Facebook page of you in the driveway this is at your was it your parents house or no my, your in-laws well, your in-laws house in -laws right house, yeah. Yeah. uh that you spent uh many uh hours shooting hoops uh you know, working through all sorts of uh, uh issues yeah. uh you and the uh and the um backboard um, that's right uh when I was in high school, I had a backboard or a broken backboard in the side of my house. And if I if I hit 10 foul shots, uh, maybe that girl will go to the prom with me. Um, <laughs> uh, I hit 10 in a row and she didn't go to the prom with me. Um, and then um, later on, when he first joined the New York Times, I was diagnosed with uh, a bad form of cancer. And one of the ways I got 
through that, at least um, mentally and emotionally, was to go out in the backyard in the winter and just kind of shoot hoops. And uh, if I hit 10 in a row, I'd survive. You know, it was that kind of thing. And there, there, there's a meditative, uh, contemplative, almost spiritual uh, ritual to just being by yourself and, and shooting baskets. So, yeah, that's what that story was partly about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. I was when just looking at this list of the notable 100 books of 2022. Any books either here or not here that you would want to recommend that people take a look at? I, I have, well, um, I'm, right now I'm reading Maggie Haberman's um, uh, book about Donald Trump. Um, uh, and I do want to read uh, the book by uh, Walt Bogdanich and uh, Michael Forsyth um, about McKinsey. Um, and uh, the great Adam Hochschild, do you know who he is? Mm -hmm. um, he just has a book now about uh, the United States um, right after World War One, from say, um, uh, I think he, I think it's roughly from two thousand, from nineteen seventeen to tw uh, nineteen twenty one, and describing the stage being set for um, what was to come um, in the United States and also on the world stage. Um, so, and I'm listening to uh, Lincoln at the Bardo by George uh, Saunders um, and to hear that 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 novel being uh, read aloud by um, Nick Offerman and, and David Sedaris and some other people, it's transporting, just flat out transporting. Well, great. Thank you for those recommendations. Just uh, flipping through here, so much in the book section because of the holiday books cover. There's so much to so much to read here and different topics, including photography and sports and, and more. History of gift books, look at that. Why not books for Christmas? This is some old ad, but it says, why not books for Christmas? Good books are the best Christmas gifts. 1906, Dan. Uh, Diana, Diana says, the New York Times placement of content in the printed form is considered important. I actually often read the paper backwards and I get a different set of takeaways or favorite stories than my husband who reads the same paper in the correct way. I find it interesting to mix it up. Well, um, most uh, many New Yorkers of a certain age would know that you would read the Daily News and the New York Post and Newsday back to front. You would begin with the sports section and work your way to the front. Right. Maybe, to, yeah. maybe as a way to brace yourself for what was, to, what was happening. Sure. A word about the New York Times Magazine, then. Uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a weekly miracle. I, you know, um, I haven't written for it lately. I wrote um, I wrote one of the um, lives they lived a few years ago. Um, but I used to write for it fairly regularly, and would like to write about write for this section again if they'd have me. But uh, the journalism is unbelievable in that, and that's that's. Uh, Jake Silverstein overseeing that. It's just great. You know, and they oversaw the 1619 project. You know, if, if, if that was the only thing the magazine did, they would have done their job well. And uh, here's John Branch's, an ad for John Branch's book. And we had sure. John, John on. Sure. Wonderful writer. Wonderful absolutely. writer. And a great absolutely. guy. Absolutely terrific. Here's Tom Stoppard. He's worried about the whole catastrophe. I'm told there's such a thing as a long view, but it never seems long enough to cope with the horizon. A lot of people would uh, agree with that right now. We have just a few moments left. We're just reading through the the Times uh, magazine, and uh, Dan Barry's with us. And uh, please give him a follow on Twitter, and check out his uh, great writing in the Times. Uh, here's a oh, this looks like a pound cake, but it's a chiffon cake. And uh, we started the show, folks, by talking about Dan's uh, writing about. Entenmann's company that makes a lot of uh, cakes and cookies. I think the cooking section and the cooking app and what they've done is really amazing at the Times. Well, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons the New York Times has been able to, to um, uh, support the journalism that it does in places like Ukraine. Um, 
they've been brilliant in in um, in celebrating and expanding the cooking section. You know, the cooking app and and also the the puzzles and all that. It's it's just uh, it's uh, quite a buffet, and uh, it supports the important journalism that's that's being done by the Times around the world. I just love this uh, lead sentence about the cardboard industry. Before it was cardboard on your doorstep, it was a, it was coarse brown paper, and before that, it was before it was paper it was a river of hot pulp, and before it was a river, it was a tree, most likely from the southeast United States. And this shows you what happens to uh, the, the cardboard that is so important in today's delivery systems. Lots, lots to see here. Uh, uh, Linda says, I'm going to eat an Entenmann's pound cake this afternoon. <laughs> uh, in role after incredible role, Jesse Buckley's exploring the darkest corners of human nature, monster talent. What are you watching on streaming these days? Um, watching uh, Magpie Murders. Um, it's a, uh, it's a British, uh, cozy, I guess they call it a, a, a murder mystery. Um, my wife, uh, Mary Trinity has worked for many years in, in domestic violence, um, being an advocate and a, and a policymaker and also having done frontline work. And so at the end of the day, um, we often look for the, 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 the easiest, funniest diverting shows and so we've been watching a show called superstore lately <laughs> just because it's like oh, a, yeah, it's it's very says it's like a palate cleanser you know it's only 22 minutes we have a few laughs and then we go to bed rather than watching some horror um, here's ken saying dan i'm 68 i'm six eight. Oh wow six foot eight inches your age let's go seriously <laughs> your life's work of illuminating the lives of the harmed and unseen people has inspired me thank you what a beautiful comment thank you ken thank you ken and uh here's a story that i've often wondered about uh avatar was the highest grossing film in history why did it vanish from the culture for so long and it's you know the the second installments coming out this month and there's supposed to be three four five i don't know how much appetite there will be for all of this but this is a, sort of like James Cam in James Cameron we trust. Uh, what do you think about Avatar? Uh, I don't think much about it. So <laughs> I, I never Did saw you see the, first the first film. Did you I've see never the seen the first one. No. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. Um, now, now I've made an enemy of James Cameron. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before we go, I do want to show folks this uh, really nice uh, special section: Escape the Cold. Uh, so if you're if snorkeling in Hawaii, discovering Caribbean culture in St. Lucia or cruising on a private island is your, your idea of a winter vacation, we have some ideas for you. So that's this. And you think, OK, I know what this is. And then you open it and it says embrace the cold instead of escaping. If skiing in Quebec, tracking winter wildlife in the Rockies or spending a cozy weekend in a snow country lodge is your idea of a winter vacation, we have some ideas for you. And uh, so and then there's an asterisk. And then when you go down here, it says prefer to escape the cold, flip the section over for ideas <laughs> for warmer spots. And they do the same thing here. So that's pretty cool. Uh, having fun with travel. I guess they, you know, we, we've talked to Amy Vership and uh, other travel writers and editors. There's so much interest in travel and the Times is finding its way back in the travel writing and coverage. Have you done much travel writing? Um, I've written about Ireland for the travel section over the years, um, but uh, not much, though. Amy, call me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Neil got to go to Amy's house and uh, do a Sunday New York Times read along with her. And that was a real oh, highlight right. of, of what we've done in seven years. Yeah, back before the pandemic uh, for the launch of the 52 places to go in 2020. Uh, she uh, invited me to her place. Seb Modak was there. He was the 2019 traveler. It was oh, definitely yeah. one And of, of course, our... no one got to travel that year. And the yeah. whole world came to, a, this is 2020, yeah. Exactly. But six weeks later, everything came to a halt. 
Before we close, I wanted to uh, make sure that uh, we, we had a few announcements to make. Dan, we want to give you a quick break. Uh, we'll take you off screen, bring you back for a pro tip before we close the show. Uh, and then we will uh, end the show in just a few minutes. Again, our guest has been Dan Barry. What an incredible conversation, Sri, and uh, to cover a lot of the great work uh, that he's done. Um, want to remind you that uh, our production team is usually uh, Sri, myself, and Paula Kiger. Sitting in for Paula Kiger today is Samya Grover. She's been doing a great job on uh, Facebook. Uh, sharing comments, uh, et cetera. So thank you, Somya, for all of your great work, adding context, adding links to articles. Again, we have PDFs of all of the stories uh, that we shared, all of Dan's stories that we shared on today's show. Uh, we also want to do a shout out to our sponsor, longtime sponsor, Muckrack, uh, and remind people that the show is produced by Digimentors, the social and digital consulting firm that Sri started with his friend, Andrew Lee. We also want to thank uh, uh, the uh, Center for Cooperative Media uh, at Montclair State University for bringing out the Local Connection newsletter. Each week, it offers story ideas and pro tips for journalists. Best of all, it's free. You can subscribe at bit.ly slash local news tips. Dan, your pro tip will make it into the Local Connection uh, newsletter when it comes out. And as a final uh, announcement, we want to give a shout out to our colleague, Rose Horowitz, who is watching uh, today's show. Uh, she's doing a Twitter Spaces uh, later today at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, focusing on the special election in Georgia. And her guest will be Shireen Mitchell uh, at Digital Sista on Twitter. So join Rose and Shireen for a Twitter Spaces uh, this uh, evening, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, with that, we'll bring back uh, Dan Barry, our incredible guest on today's show. Uh, Dan, again, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, it was wonderful to look at your writing, to hear your insights. You had a lot to say about the paper and about some of your colleagues that you sit next to. Um, uh, so I, I think it worked out really well. Thank you so much. No, thank you for having me. Um, so a pro tip for writers, uh, what would be your advice uh, for, for writers? You know, I, I'm not gonna say use active verb tense. <laughs> um, I, I would say for journalists, um, it, it, the challenge for us is to uh, remain curious, to not become inured to the circumstance, to, to be constantly questioning and challenging and be aware of the wonders that are going on around you and then trying to figure out how to turn that awareness into stories. You know, do not become inured. That's what I would say. Well great said. Advice. Great, great advice. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. It was a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank and you. Thank, thank you, you both of you, all of you. Life all these years. We had a right. few comments come in. Nikhil said thoughtful, insightful discussion. Always learn so much. Jonathan said great show. Linda, a great show today. Thank you. Uh, and great show as well from Diana. Uh, thank you, Dan. I learned a lot. Um, as a reminder, folks, uh, you can watch if you joined us late. Uh, you can catch the show on the same links where you're watching from the beginning, just a few minutes after we go off the air. Uh, Ellen also uh, thanked us for the show. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, with that, we will conclude today's show um, and uh, see you again next week. Take care. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.